Thank you for joining us on the France 24 interview. I'm here at the uh, conference, the annual conference of the uh, French Employers Confederation. The keynote speaker this year is Sherry Blair, a judge and barrister, women's rights activist. She's also famous around the world for being the uh, wife of Britain's former prime minister, Tony Blair. And she's our guest today on France 24. Sherry Blair, thank you for being our guest. Well, thank you for having me. You've just uh, addressed an audience of uh, French business leaders. Throughout the week, they're going to uh, discuss about the role of corporate ethics and uh, how to restore these uh, morality into uh, business practices. Do you have the feeling that uh, the crisis has cast a harsh spotlight on their responsibility, tarnishing not only their uh, morality and their image, but also their reputation as uh, good business leaders conducting sound management practices? Well, I think that would be a very sweeping statement to, to make about the generality of business. I think that's what's one of the interesting things that's, that's happening is the way corporate social responsibility has become very much uh, the buzzword in business. I mean, not just actually in the last year, but over the last decade. And I think we see more and more companies who want to be uh, good citizens, to make a positive contribution to the world, and actually who have the power to make a difference in the world. And that's, I'm sure, why uh, today's conference will be so successful, because they're, they're talking about things that actually matter to business. As a lawyer, you've specialized in employment and discrimination, and you're currently leading the prosecution against the Royal Bank of Scotland on behalf of British pension funds. RBS was the bank that last year posted the biggest losses on records in uh, British corporate history. What led you to accept this case? Well, it, it, first of all, I can't say much about a, a forthcoming case because obviously there's lots of uh, professional uh, rules about that. And it's not a prosecution because it's a civil case. Um, but I was very um, delighted to be approached by a US firm, Coughlin Stoyer, to uh, assist them in taking uh, action again in, on behalf of pension funds against RBS. Uh, there's no doubt since I've taken the case, I have had many, many people write to me. Uh, ordinary people who invested their life savings, whose pensions have been affected by what happened in RBS. And they are looking for, for answers about what happened. And obviously they're also looking for, for, for proper compensation if it turns out that wrong deeds were done. Whose interests ought to be uh, defended first? Those of uh, shareholders? account holders or taxpayers? Well, isn't it about uh, the difficulty is about managing everybody's interests and getting, because a shareholder is also a taxpayer, uh, an account holder uh, will also be a taxpayer, employees will be involved, uh, a responsible business practices involve looking at the wide range of stakeholders in a business and not simply concentrating on only one aspect. But of course, the, the, the RBS case goes beyond that and it goes into questions of whether, in fact, there was wrongdoing in the sense of, 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 of negligence or recklessness. Speaking of negligence and recklessness at RBS, the former boss, Fred Goodwin, has been heavily criticised for his role in the dismay of the company. And he still gets a £340,000 a year pension for life. Do you understand the outburst of violence against him that led him to uh, flee Britain to France for five months? Well, I certainly think that violence is no answer to, to, to any issue. And uh, indeed, I know that uh, Sir Fred Goodwin has indeed uh, had volunteer, volunteered to give up some of, some of his pension. But the issue, of course, um, is, is a wider one than, than that. This isn't just about one person. This is about uh, whether there was a, a culture in, in, in a company that led it to go astray. Now, let's go back to the uh, conference this year, the annual conference of the French employers, and, and the children will take centre stage with themes such as, uh, such, so various as uh, the place of children in society, the role of companies towards children, how children can be targeted by advertising company and the media, also the uh, uh, problem of child labour under globalisation. 
you obviously know how to deal with uh, these different issues yourself. You're a mother of four children, and, and your last child, Leo, he was born in 2000, the first child actually to be born to a serving prime minister in over 150 years. Is it the fact that you grew up in a single parent family that made it so important to you not to sacrifice your private life to your own career? Well, I think that um, whenever I was, uh, as a young lawyer and a young mother, uh, struggling, as I did sometimes, with how, how to, to balance that, I used to think about my own mother. My own mother was, as you say, abandoned by my father, left to bring up two little girls. She, because her own mother had died, had had to leave school at 14, so she didn't have my education opportunities. She certainly didn't earn anything like the income that I earned as, as, as a lawyer. And I felt that, you know, she did a fantastic job. And if, if she could manage, I had little to complain about. So she was a fantastic role model for me. Back in the early 80s, you seemed to have a promising political career yourself. And, and finally, you married the man who happened to become the uh, youngest British prime minister. Do you have any regrets when you think at what could have been your own political career? Well, I think what I learned when I stood for Parliament, and there was a time in 1983 when actually Tony didn't have a seat and I did have a seat, and so Tony actually was the candidate's spouse. This was a role that he found very uncomfortable, particularly on one occasion I went to discuss tactics with my agent and Tony came along too, and at the end, we'd had lunch, and at the end of lunch, the male agent said to him, Tony, would you mind doing the washing up whilst I speak politics with Cherie? Um, but what I actually learned through that election campaign and, and what I remain convinced of ever since is that Tony is a far better politician than I would ever have been and I'm a much better lawyer. Would he be a good president for the European Union? You've <laughs> been the first lady for Britain. Do you want to be the first lady for the uh, European Union? I, think that I don't think we want to get engaged in theoretical issues. <laughs> but so far he's been endorsed by several ministers in Britain. <laughs> I think that the, really the, you have to ask him about him about that. But do you feel like living in Brussels? <laughs> <laughs> Brussels, of course, is a wonderful place to be. I've been to Brussels on a, on a number of occasions. Paris is a fantastic city. London is a fantastic city. We are so lucky in Europe. We have uh, this incredible wealth of history and of culture. And best of all, through the European Union, we can share it. Now, even as Europe's potentially uh, Europe's first lady, you would still well, have your role. I acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically, anyway. Uh, you would still have a role, the one you found for yourself after you left Downing Street, with your foundation for uh, women's empowerment. You're promoting equality of opportunity for women across the world. Don't you think these uh, notions of uh, uh, gender equality and, and, and women's empowerment have different meanings to different people. How can women from countries such, uh, with such uh, uh, diverse cultures as China, India or Britain share their experience and advance the cause of women? Well, actually, I think having been myself just last week in China and about uh, to go and address a conference in India at the end of the year about why women mean business, I have to tell you that the women in China and the women in India and the women here in Europe have a huge amount in common. All those women that I spoke to are interested in the basic issues. How, we, how do we become good mothers, good spouses and good employees? How do we balance our work life? Why is it that women somehow don't seem to be able to make it to the top of organisations? What policies can we pursue to make that happen? And also, how do we enable women to, to, to get financial independence. And that's particularly what my foundation is about because apart from my education, the other thing I felt that I had, which my mother didn't have, was that ability to use my education to achieve my own financial independence. And one of the aims of the foundation is exactly to help other women do that because as you rightly point out, there are still plenty of areas in the world where women are literally denied access to finance, to run business, denied access to certain businesses simply because they are women. And I don't think that's a matter of cultural relativism. I think actually that's a matter of basic human rights that each man and each woman should have equal opportunities. And it happens to be also a matter of international law endorsed by all the countries of the UN in the various international covenants. So the question is, how do we help different nations at different stages of development reach those common goals? And these common goals will be addressed during a conference 
in December in Mumbai. Will you be there? And what exactly will you have to tell these other women who will be there as well? Oh, I'm, I'm, defi I'm definitely going to be there, along with some fantastic women who already are making a difference in, in Indian society, who already are heading major banks, major companies, uh, running their own businesses, uh, some, some, of the, some of the wealthiest women in India who actually care about making sure that other women have the opportunities that they've been uh, able to uh, take advantage of. And so we will be talking about many of the issues which I think the women in this conference today and the men in this conference today want to talk about. And one of the things I wanted to make sure of in my own conference was that we had men speakers speaking about this. Because as I said to this conference today, this is something that women can't do on their own. Women need to do this in partnership with men. And that when we have men and women together as equal partners with equal respect, equal dignity, that's actually when we make the best, whether it's in our marriages, in our businesses or in our societies. Now, there's another important summit coming before this Mumbai meeting, a G20 summit in Pittsburgh by the end of this month. Don't you think it's about time for world leaders to put gender equality on top of their agenda? Well, I absolutely do. And I'm delighted, for example, that one of the first things that Hillary Clinton said in her speech when she became Secretary of State for the US was to highlight the question of gender equality. Um, I think that it's always been uh, certainly uh, under both my husband and Gordon Brown at the centerpiece of Britain's political program. And uh, I think we can be quite proud in Europe that we have made strides in relation to the legal rights for women, which I, I happen to be very aware of because it's one of the ways that I make my living. So you're still optimistic about the results of this G20. Do you think this I will think be that, addressed? I think that if the G20 uh, addresses the issue of how we can help women help themselves, that that will be a huge um, key to how we deal with tackling issues like poverty, uh, lack of education, uh, public health, all these issues, women play a huge role in that. But again, as I said, it's women and men working together that can really make the difference. Thank you very much, Sherry Blair, for being our guest today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for watching. Please stay tuned to France 24.